We acknowledge and respect the first humans of the unceded land we call San Francisco, the Ramaytoshaloni. We condemn the genocide of these and other tribes across the Western Hemisphere. We honor their legacy and history, and we support rematriation and sovereignty efforts. Hello, and welcome to Storied San Francisco, a podcast all about the people and places that make this city unique. I'm your host, Jeff Hunt. A few years ago, we learned that a new production would be taking over the space in North Beach, where Beach Blanket Babylon had existed for nearly half a century. Fast forward to earlier this year, and something on social media caught our eye. The Dear San Francisco show at Club Fugazi posted about the 10,000 plus love letters to San Francisco, written by folks who'd seen their show. Love letters to the city was our season three theme here on Storied, so we immediately reached out to them to get them on this show. In part one, we meet co-producer and executive director David Dower. David shares the history of the space, the stories of the Pickle Family Circus and Seven Fingers, and the origins of Dear San Francisco. If you haven't seen this show yet, which runs seven times each week, please do. And get ready to be thoroughly amazed. Here's David. My career took me to the East Coast for 15 years, and then this opportunity came up, and I was one of the three people involved in this that were like, no, let's come home. And uh, so we all decided to come back It's a big coast. Where were you? So I was was in Boston when the opportunity came up. I left here to go to Washington, D.C., to Arena Stage, and then became the artistic director at Arts Emerson in Boston. Okay. And uh, that's where I actually met Seven Fingers for the first time, ah. though I had actually trained with the Pickle Family Circus when I lived here originally, and I had met Shana and Gypsy when they were much younger, and I was much younger, at the Pickles. So it's okay. a full circle story for me, but... Yeah, I love that. I'm thinking, let's come back to that, sure. and let's go back like chronologically sure. about where we are and the very rich history yeah. of this space. We are sitting in the tiara at Club Fugazi, which is part of Casa Colonial Fugazi. And this building uh, was built by John Fugazi and Joanna Fugazi and opened in 1914. Okay. So John Fugazi, which the Italians here say Fugazi, was one of the first bankers in this neighborhood after the earthquake to help rebuild North Beach. That bank merged and became Bank of Italy, and then that merged again and became the Bank of America. America. So, Giannini? Yeah, was AP that? Giannini. Giannini, mm-hmm. yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. So this building, and, and it's been very heavily supported by uh, Giannini in the beginning and Ghirardelli in the beginning. It was given as a gift to the Italian community of North Beach by John and Joanna Fugazi. And the condition of that gift is that this room, which was called Fugazi Hall originally, that this room had to remain what they called a palace of culture. Okay. In, in that the, sounds very in the gift covenant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the only reason there's still a theater on this block. Amazing. So Amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's the history of the building. And then this room has had an incredible history, too. So it started out in 1914 and well into the mid-century. This was primarily a dance hall and at times a lecture hall. And uh, so all the great opera singers or pop bands and dance bands, all of those touring Italy from Italy came here and played Club Fugazi when they Amazing. came to San Francisco. And it was called Club Fugazi at well, that it was point, called Fugazi Hall, Fugazi for, Hall for most of that time. I think it didn't become Club Fugazi until Beach Blanket. Okay. And so we jump ahead a little bit, but before the Beach Blanket arrived, this was also where Thelonious Monk recorded Thelonious Alone in San Francisco on that stage live. John Hendrix and Wes Montgomery also recorded live albums here. The Grateful Dead had their first album release party here. Maybe one of your listeners can tell me whether this guy was right or wrong, but in December, a gentleman was here for the show and he said he used to come here during high school years for his high school dances and Janis Joplin fronted that band. So I can't find any record of that, but it tracks. Let's go with that. <laughs> Let's let's go with yes, that happened. And also listeners, if you have Yeah, if have you any. know different, let us know. And then uh, this was also where all the beat poets read for decades, organized by Lawrence Ferlinghetti mm-hmm. and Gary Snyder. And then 
come 1974. Okay. Beach Blanket Babylon, which had been running at the Savoy Tivoli, ran out of time at the Savoy Tivoli, and they came over here on a six-week lease, and they left 45 years later. The longest-running musical parody in the history of the United States was in this room. (laughs) I'm also, did they also run out of space? Or did the show change when it came here with more space? Oh, yeah, it grew when it came here, yeah. I mean, I'm thinking the hats. The hats got higher, the cast got bigger, (laughs) yeah. Yeah. It started on the street here in North Beach. It was just three of them. Wow. Um, So, yeah, there's a great history of Beach Blanket, and people should dig into it. Totally. Uh, It's going to the Smithsonian now. so, So it's had such a big impact on the American culture, not just our culture, that it's going into the American pop culture wing of the Smithsonian. That's so, so great, mm-hmm. as it should. I just want to say real quickly, you know, we, we haven't been doing this podcast very long, but we were trying to get them before they closed. Mm. Um, we were in talks and then it fell apart and then they then they shut down and yeah. pandemic and all that stuff. But can you just, for those who don't know now that it is defunct just like a sentence or two to describe that show well yeah and it's germane because one of the reasons that we knew about this room and wanted to come and, and take on this room was because of what beach blanket had been Beach Blanket Babylon, it, it was a musical parody that used a lot of re-lyric uh, pop songs or original music. And it was Snow White's journey to find love. And it traveled through San Francisco. It traveled all of these different ways, very hilarious and sort of kitschy ways of that, that Snow White might be trying to find love. The main feature of it were these increasingly wonderfully Extravagant, elaborate, elaborate extravagant. over the top is really yes. what they were. <laughs> Wigs yes. and hats that culminated in this famous picture that you've seen, which with the woman coming out at the end uh, with the San Francisco skyline on her head. It was a lot of fun for a lot of years. One of the main things it was besides fun, though, was that it held a spot that sort of was the character of San Francisco. Mm. If you wanted to touch San Francisco as an arts and culture outing, you came here. You sent your friends here. You came with your family year over year. It sort of had the heart of San Francisco in its hand the whole time. I love that. And when the room closed, there was a gap there. And Shana and Gypsy, who are San Francisco natives and the creators of Dear San Francisco, understood that absence. Mm -hmm. And then the lockdown came and we understood the depth of the darkness now. Mm-hmm. It wasn't just that the room was dark, but now it was dark. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Period. Then the world was dark. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so coming back seemed both important and, and uh, appropriate. And to do something that reanimated that spot that was missing, that filled that heart space back in uh, for the city through live event in this room seemed like, okay, a responsibility. If you love the city, you got to live this city. And to live this city, you got to have this space and it's got to be thriving. So we came back to do that. A lot of people would say like, oh, you know, we stand on the shoulders of giants. We we stand on the hats. Yes, we have big hats to fill. That's what we (laughs) say. (laughs) Okay, well, now that we're kind of caught up to the the origins of the show, Dear San Francisco, Mm -hmm. you dropped a couple of names, and yeah. you also dropped the Pickle Family Circus. Can you tell folks all about yes, that? Yes, I can. Please. So, uh, yeah, because I think it's an under-celebrated impact of the city of San Francisco on world culture, the circus uh, community here, mm-hmm. and what has happened over the years. So, back in the 70s, uh, certainly, and earlier, uh, Pickle Family Circus was a shock to the system of American circus, where there had been three rings and animals and all of that kind of spectacle of Ring Ring Brothers, Brothers and, and yeah, Big yeah. Apple and all of those. Mm-hmm. Uh, Pickles was an antidote to that in a way. It stood as a, in relief to that. It was single ring, no animals. It was designed to serve a community purpose. Everywhere they toured up and down the West Coast was a community benefit. Hmm. And there, was a, there was a nonprofit that benefited from that. So right. it was a very kind of different approach to the idea of circus and entertainment. For them, it was a community development endeavor all along. And they emerged at the same time as the mime troupe and actually from the mime troupe in some ways. Okay. Um, Some overlap there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so the Pickle Family Circus was for years here, you know, a dominant circus in San Francisco for decades. Bill Irwin, uh, many people will recognize that name Mm -hmm. and you'll see him all over the television and film and Broadway. Bill Irwin was one of the first 
clowns in the Pickle Family Circus, okay. along with Larry Pizzoni and Jeff Hoyle, another name that people here in San Francisco certainly will recognize. Did they have a specific location or the Pickles? Well, in, they had in, their in they had their place that they trained, but yeah. they and they built their shows, but they performed in parks and yeah, in community yeah. centers all up yeah. and down the coast, and and in theaters, the Palace of Fine Arts they would um, perform at. So that circus kind of then changed what people thought of as American circus. And then they brought in a master teacher from China okay. named Master Lu Yi. And he had a profound impact on that company and how they were performing on the circus school itself and what they were learning. And also on American circus suddenly started to have all of these disciplines in it that it had never had before, like the Chinese pole and the Chinese mm. hoops and, and the you know, the Diablo, all of these things started to come into the pickles. The umbrella? No, was that uh, part the, of that? The umbrella is also coming out, come out, <laughs> out of China. All that stuff started to come in through the circus school, through Lu Yi, okay. and into the pickles, but then also into these kids who were studying who went into Cirque du Soleil and then they went around the world. Shana Carroll and Gypsy Snyder are two of the two creators of this show, studied with Lu Yi. Okay. And as part of Pickle. Yes, while they were uh, training with the Pickles and Gypsy Snyder's parents founded the Pickle Family Circus. Right. Shana came up through the Pickle Family Circus. Okay. Shana's dad is John Carroll. John Carroll for uh, 50 years, the columnist for the Chronicle. Chronicle writer, so yeah. deep San Francisco roots mm -hmm. here in mm -hmm. this uh, event that takes place at Fugazi now. And then uh, many of the people who are coming into the show who are San Francisco acrobats are also, San Francisco-based acrobats, are also people who came up through Louise training. Gypsy and Shana joined Cirque du Soleil very early on. Oh, okay. And in their work with Cirque, they met another five acrobats that they all decided to leave and found their own company. So that became the Seven Fingers. And okay. It's 21 years old now. It's grown up in Montreal. It has a very big worldwide presence, but a very small presence in the U.S. still, mm. and has never had a U.S. home in the U.S., a, a U.S. home. Okay. And so when Fugazi became available, we that's when we decided, okay, it's time for a U.S. home. We will go back to San Francisco, which where this all emanated from, because the first conversations about founding Seven Fingers also took place here in the city. Uh. And so we, it's a homecoming, and we would make a show that was about our city and what it is that we love about it, how we feel about it, and how we can inspire others to be resilient around the challenges that we were facing at the time, and now push back on the narrative that's trying to overtake us about this doom loop. You yes. know? Oh yeah, the doom loop. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, that. Today is a significant day in the history yes, of the is. doom loop, and we won't. We don't need to get into that. But just a quick question, because I do want to speak to my own experience of seeing the show and and sort of yes, what the please. what the show did and what it says and what it means but the other five of seven fingers are they part of this show or are they no. here or okay no the fingers now work as an artistic collective where each of the Got artistic it. directors does their own projects with a huh? central organization and so gypsy and shana frequently work on their own but in this case they were working together because they were making it about their hometown Got so it. the others are working on various other projects and actually in multiple media we, we do vr work we do motion capture work for video oh. games we do all kinds Amazing. of things we have cruise ships that we have shows yes. on we do opening ceremonies of Olympics and Broadway shows. I mean, it just goes everywhere. Yeah. Didn't y'all do one of the giants? This is a maybe, I don't know if there was a show, but you did the national anthem. We just sang the national anthem on Tuesday the 11th, so that's the nice. day before yesterday. Nice. And they won. You know, um, oh, yeah. <laughs> the, Dear San Francisco Acrobats, the giants are 2-0 and when we sing. Yeah. The uh, warriors are 6-0 and when the acrobats wow. have been there. And the parrots are the official animal of San Francisco. San Francisco. These are winning stats, mm -hmm. folks. I, I think, um, you know, call us. We'll come. Yeah, I mean, it's <laughs> like, let's get a regular gig for all this. Exactly. <laughs> Hello, Warriors. We're ready. <laughs> what I wanted to say, and I, I, I don't know if even this warrants a response, but seeing the show, you know, I grew up as a kid in the suburbs of Texas and I probably went to a Ringling Brothers mm -hmm. show or two. And so I've never seen anything like this show. Just the whole time, I felt like my jaw was on the ground and I was the things I was saying were what the fuck? And like, <laughs> I just what? Uh, uh. <laughs> And then I thought about it the days after I saw the show and I was thinking, because I was in tears like a lot of people, yeah. I was thinking about like, it could have been just the physical 
mm-hmm. acts that were happening, and mm-hmm. it would have been a mind blowing show. But the fact that it is a narrative, yeah, made it even more beyond. Yeah. So there's a couple of things, and, and I love that that's your experience. That's a very common experience. It's the sort of like, what just happened? And <laughs> you know? like, and how did they do that? <laughs> Twenty eight or forty times yeah. in like a one and a half hour yeah. period. <laughs> but but you're picking up something that's really uh, essential in the fingers seven fingers work. Part of the reason, the main reason that these acrobats left Cirque du Soleil to start Seven Fingers this 20 plus years ago now was that they would do these incredible things and they would be, it would be the thing that they did that night. So they, you know, the aerialist, Shana was an aerialist, the aerialist would do their number. At the end, they take their bows. They were dressed in some costume. Who knows? It might have been an alien or a lizard or a, or a <laughs> bird. Who knows what they were? But then all these people take their bows and the audience has no idea who they were. They don't know which skills anybody did. And and that got to be old for yeah. for people who were trained to do everything, mm. not to have anybody know that at the end of an, all of that work, 10 times a week. And so they started their own company where you actually know who everybody is before the night is over. They tell their own stories and you see that they do every single thing in the show. Yeah. So they're singing, they're, they're playing instruments, there's text, they're doing these incredible <laughs> acrobatics. And then they have these moments where they just like, everything stops and focuses on them. Mm-hmm. But they also, they tell their own stories throughout mm-hmm. the night. That's why it's moving. And I think one of the hallmarks of the fingers is that whenever they start a project, particularly Shana and Gypsy, if you see their other works, even separately, but especially together, they start from what is the emotion in me mm-hmm. about this theme? Mm-hmm. And they try to get every acrobat who comes into the project to connect there first. Right. Yes, you can do all of these skills and you're going to have to do all of them. If you don't play the banjo yet, you will before we open, you know, <laughs> yes. but get here first. Yeah. And so like when we came here to make San Francisco, the Dear San Francisco project, the acrobats were asked to start writing right away about what they were discovering about mm-hmm. San Francisco or what they already knew about San Francisco. Mm-hmm. A lot of that writing is in the show. Mm-hmm. So the final, you know, Dear San Francisco letter that Pan speaks, that's her experience. Oh. Oh, wow. Um, okay. When Song tells the story of his wife and the Diablo and it brought them here, that's his experience. Amazing. Um, all of them, the opening poem that Devin reads, all of that is material that they create before they ever do the first flip or climb a pole. Right. They go and touch the theme for themselves so that everything emanates from there. And let's face it, it's an emotional time for San Francisco. And yeah. so like when I say this to people, they're like, it's a circus. Why do are people crying? <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah, come, <laughs> come open and you'll find out. <laughs> but isn't that like the classic thing? It's like the clown is smiling and laughing and frowning. Yeah. And we had a, a beautiful moment last night or the night before where a, a gentleman stopped on the way out to say, so the show ends with this moment of writing words of loss and pain that have had crept up during COVID, like the words that we used to just drilled into us all through the COVID isolation and they're written on a body. And then that body does these incredible things that transforms those words. Ultimately they're washed off and there's a sense of the Phoenix rising or a sense of renewal or sense of rebirth. Yeah. Rebirth. Yeah. Out of the storm, you know? (laughs) And so the gentleman came up and he said, you know, that is the clearest expression of my decades in recovery. I saw those words, you washed them off, and I feel the cleanest I felt since I began my journey of recovery. Holy shit, and you guys are all My God, yeah, back at you. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Wow, that's incredible. But I think it's because the acrobats are in in touch with that, Mm -hmm. that it's not a dry technical experience. Mm -hmm. Because it could be wonderful just as that. But Yeah, and I want to say that depth shows 100%. Um, I mean, I read a little bit about the program about each performer, Mm -hmm. but then just hearing what kind of emotional journey they go through to even get ready to do this show. Yeah. It totally shows. Yeah. One last question is just off the top of my head. Like Beach Blanket Babylon, does this show change over time? Yeah. So what's interesting about Circus is that, first of all, our cast changes. That's how this show changes. The cast is on different lengths of contracts, three, six months. Some of them have come in for shorter or some now been here for more than a year. But as the cast changes, they come with new skills and new expertise. And so that gets worked into the same structure. So basically the show 
maintains the same structure of an acrobatic love letter to the city. Okay. But you saw hula hoops where there was yes, a, where there was a unicycle. Okay. Uh, you saw uh, juggling where there were silks. Things change very regularly in that way. So lots of people are coming, you know, multiple times. I think the record, I just looked at the data the other day. Somebody's already been here 15 times oh, wow. and we've only been open for a little over a year. <laughs> That's yes. great. But people keep coming to say, oh, and, and it's so different. And actually, they saw the same cast, the exact same show. They sat in a different place. Ah, <laughs> they yeah. think they saw a different show. But because it's built in the round and there's so much made for each orientation of the theater, there's elements of the show that you don't see each time. I so. would think also there's so much to it that they're like a really rich movie or yeah. something that there's things that you just don't remember. Yeah. Also. Yeah. And, and if you sit like if you sit in the front, it's just all on your head and you <laughs> no nope right. way you can see the whole thing. If you sit at the back, the, all the little things you miss. That's why people keep coming and coming. But they also are coming because they want to bring everybody they know. And it's a very common experience where somebody will see it for the first time. Most common is somebody sees it because their work group came or their you know athletic league or something. And they go, ah, I got to get my, fa my family here. And then they go and they're back like within a week. And whenever that happens, they come in all embarrassed like... Sorry, we're back. <laughs> no, no, you do you. That's what's keeping like, this thing this is going. A good so. thing. Yeah. Well, I don't know if you mentioned this, David, but do you host or MC every night? I do. The one I saw you did, and I want to say that you did a fabulous job. Oh. And you, that's another reason for folks, especially who are listening to this podcast, to come see the show. So, oh, do you have anything else? I just else? talk. I don't do any of the acrobatics. <laughs> That's, I think that's important, though. You, well, you set the stage. Yes. Literally. Yeah. Um, anything else that you'd like to say to our listeners before we wrap up? No, I just, I hope you'll come. I hope you'll continue to, like, struggle for this city. I think the city needs all of us. And we're really honored and feel the weight of the responsibility here. And we really appreciate the people in the city who are keeping this open. That was David Dower. On the next episode of Storied SF, we'll meet two cast members from Dear San Francisco, Maya Kesselman Cruz and Dominic Cruz. Part two drops next Tuesday. Music for Storied San Francisco was produced, performed, and curated by Otis McDonald. Michelle Kilfeather does original photography for us. Aaron Lim of Bitch Talk Podcast is our contributing producer. And the show is produced and hosted by me, Jeff Hunt. Special thanks on this episode to sound designer Kayla Anchel. Now in our fifth season, we have more than 200 episodes available on our website, storiedsf.com, or wherever you listen to podcasts. If you're able to, please rate and review the show. And drop us a line at storiedsf at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. Stay strong, weird, and healthy. And we'll see you next time on Storied San Francisco. This podcast is a proud member of the BFF.FM podcast network. Learn more at podcast.bff.fm. BFF.FM, best frequencies forever.